Good morning. And welcome to worship at the First Congregational Church of Woodstock, where whoever you are and wherever you find yourself on your life or spiritual journey, you are welcome here. Today is a special day in the, in the church calendar. It is Palm Sunday, so if you didn't get a palm when you came in, um, raise your hand and the ushers and the deacons will make sure that they pass them around. There are also um, palms at either of the entrances. Throughout the service, we encourage you to celebrate this joyful festival occasion, um, especially as we sing in our opening song and the choir sings the anthem. And anytime we say Hosanna, uh, we encourage you to join in the celebration, um, celebrating the love and the presence of, of God and Christ within us. I invite you to continue to prepare your hearts for worship as we offer our prayer of presence. And then at the end of the prayer of presence, we're going to have a special blessing of the palms. And so uh, at the end of the prayer of presence, I will invite you to lift up your palms that we may bless them today. Will you join me? God of the foolish cross, tottering down the streets of Jerusalem on a donkey, you are not the savior we expect. Your power doesn't look like the power we want our God to demonstrate. Your wisdom makes no sense to us. We are happy to join the crowd waving branches, but not so sure we want to follow you into the temple courts, into the upper room, into the Garden of Gethsemane, to the foot of the cross. Forgive our false assumptions. Clarify our clouded vision. Let us relax into the foolishness of your love, your grace. Hosanna, Hosanna, save us, we beseech you. I invite you now to lift up your palms as we bless these palms of the parade. Creator God, bless these palms. May they remind us of the simple joys of living. May we remember the excitement that comes with following Christ. Bless these protest palms, O God of justice. May they remind us that empire is not a thing of the past. May they make us bold and brave to stand up against injustice. Bless these funeral palms, O God of comfort. May they remind us of the road that lies ahead. May they encourage us in times of grief and pain. We give you thanks for the parade, the protest, the processional. Guide our steps through the strongest of weeks as we cry together, Hosanna, 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 Amen.
anything, God, today, you march into Jerusalem to save us. Guide us through the wisdom of your spirit that we might see what you are calling us to see, to know what you are calling us to know, and to feel what you are calling us to feel, that we may respond to your gospel call, call of grace with gladsome hearts and minds. Amen. Our gospel reading is from the gospel according to Mark, uh, chapter 11, verses 11 through 19, from the Inclusive Bible. After they entered Jerusalem, Jesus went into the temple precincts. He inspected everything there, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany, accompanied by the twelve. The next day when they were leaving Bethany, Jesus felt hungry. Observing a fig tree covered with foliage, foliage some distance off, he went over to see if the tree contained any fruit. But in, upon inspecting it, he found only leaves. It was not the season for figs. Jesus addressed the fig tree and said, No one will ever eat fruit from you again. And the disciples witnessed this. Jesus entered the temple and began driving out those engaged in selling and buying. He overturned the money changers' tables and the stalls of those selling doves. Moreover, he would not permit anyone to carry goods through the temple area. Then he began to teach them. Doesn't scripture say, my house will be called a house of prayer for all the peoples? But you have turned it into a den of thieves. The chief priests and the religious scholars heard about this and they began looking for a way to destroy him. At the same time, they were fearful because the whole crowd was under the spell of his teaching. May these words comfort, challenge, and inspire us. Thanks be to God. So I will confess that this is like my favorite story of Jesus. You know, too often it just feels like, you know, Jesus is, is up on this pedestal or, or Jesus. It's hard to relate to, 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 to this one who's supposed to be the son of God, who has all this incredible wisdom and is just like so incredibly perfect all the time. And for a long time, I will confess, I couldn't relate to that story or that God or that Jesus. But I'm going to tell you, this Jesus, I totally get I mean, sure, he rides in on that, on that, on that, that donkey in. But even that, even that, Jesus is making trouble. I love this. Jesus is a troublemaker. That's the Jesus that I understand, that I can get behind. And boy, it took me most of my life to figure that out. I mean, think about it. Jesus makes trouble. He gets in trouble, but he gets in trouble for all the right reasons. And that's the difference. I was reminded of this not too long ago. Coffee hour, a few weeks ago, I was walking out and somebody looked at me and said, oh, here comes trouble. And I looked, were they talking about me? Couldn't be me, not me. But that brought us into a whole conversation that there is different kinds of trouble. There's bad trouble where we're just causing chaos or we're doing what we want for the sake of what we want. But then there's a better kind of trouble. It is the kind of trouble that Jesus gets into. It's why he upsets the temple authorities and the powers in Rome. It is why he is the person that so many who feel so pushed down by the ways of the world and the systems of discrimination and injustice can relate. It is why the people who feel oppressed can identify with a God who is with us, even in the depths of the valley of our despair. And for me, the beginning of this story, of, 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 of how this week unfolds, for me, is, is, is really the metaphor for what I believe it truly means to follow Jesus. Everything else is almost like a prelude. This is the whole point of the Jesus story, the narrative of the God who comes to us. Sure, it ends the end of this week with, with Jesus being betrayed and denied and going to the cross, and we're going to talk about that bit of the story when it comes to Monday, Thursday. And then there's the silence that happens from 3 o'clock on Friday afternoon until until. The first of the disciples, the women, they go to the tomb and they see that that 
that stone has been rolled away and that the tomb is empty. And only later that day do they realize what has actually happened. That the powers and the forces that be do not have the final word. That violence within our world does not have the final word. That God's love and grace and hope is so much greater than all of the schemes and the powers that exist within this world. And for me, that whole story begins to unfold with this story of Jesus riding in on that, 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 that little donkey with people waving their palms and that whole procession and that whole parade. And that's the beginning of it. But if we leave the story there and then jump forward, either to the resurrection or even to Monday, Thursday, we miss all of the power and the urgency of his ministry. My own practice over the last several years has been to pick one of the Gospels and, and during Holy Week to begin with the triumphal entry and then to read story after story after story after story all throughout the week until we get to Easter. Because to stay within any one of the Gospels, what you actually find out is that there is a ton of the urgent, most powerful prophetic teachings of Jesus that happen in this most faithful Fateful of weeks. In some of the Gospels, the story of the Good Samaritan, the new commandment to love one another, the institution of the Lord's Supper, the breaking of the bread, Jesus telling us that we're not just servants and disciples, but that Jesus is our friend. All of that happens and unfolds within the week. And if we only extract little bits and verses and, and, and we kind of show up on Sunday and we show up on Sunday and we miss the, whole, the depth of that story. It took me a long time before I had the courage to open up that book and to read that story and to stick with the pain that is that journey that travels from the triumphal entry to his betrayal and his trial, and his death. But we have to stick with it, just like we have to stick with our own story, because to stick with it is to then understand the hope that we have in the love of the God who is with us as we journey in our own lives to the depths of despair and grief and loss, who yet is with us and gives us the hope that fear and hurt and death does not have the final word within our own but let's go back to the story that Tom read to us today. Because there is so much in that little passage that tells us everything about the urgency, about what Jesus' ministry is all about. What do we make of this? The palm waving. The riding in on the donkey. And then this, this, this bizarre little tangent where Jesus pulls aside in order to chew out a fig tree. I have to tell you, that is like my favorite story in all of Scripture. I mean, imagine that, right? It's, it's the urgency of this week. Jesus knows that things are unfolding, right? The signs are there. He understands it. We heard the story last week that some people show up, and he knows. He knows that, that, that the end is starting to unfold. He knows this. And yet, in the middle of all that, after the triumphal parade, they go. He checks out the temple. He looks around. It's late. And so they go off and they have a good night's sleep. And then on the way back, he's hungry. And there's a fig tree. And it's in leaf. But it doesn't have any figs. What do we make of that? Why was that important enough that somebody decided to put it into the texts that still exist 2,000 years to this day? It's not a throwaway line. There's something that tells us about this ministry, about this journey, about what does it mean to really follow this one who is willing to go all the way to the cross in order to demonstrate that God's love is greater than all of our fear. For a long time, I thought that that was a commentary just about... Um, the, 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 the state of not just fig trees, um, but that that 
tree was representative of, of, of the religious authorities of that day. And that is one possible interpretation of what is the whole point about the fig. But, but I've been doing a lot more research. And I read, I read this essay that somebody actually thought about and they, 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 they took a look. Because Jesus, I think, would know when a fig ought to be producing figs. And it's not just that it was out of season. When, when we're told that it was out of season, I don't think that that's talking about the, 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 the season in terms of when the figs are producing their fruit. I think that's talking about the season in terms of the economy of the people in which they were living. Part of the analysis based on, on, on the history and the things that have been unearthed that we've been able to knit together through other writing that tell us about the history of those times was that in that time when Herod ruled, he was a bit of a despot. And when Herod ruled, it was the temple authorities who actually had instituted all kinds of systems that initially were meant to be able to give people access, greater access, to be able to come to worship God that over time devolved to actually become mechanisms of oppression. Not only that, but it's believed in that time that the people who were wealthy, who were the landowners, no longer were leaving the bits of fruit that they were supposed to be leaving so that the poor of the day would be able to be traveling down and see a fig tree and be able to feed themselves. It is believed that the reason why there was no fruit on that fig tree may very well have been because the people who owned that particular fig tree had stripped it bare, had taken everything for themselves. For me, everything that unfolds from, from the triumphal entry and the way that Jesus chooses to enter to the fig tree, to the turning over of the tables, to the destruction of the, of the seats of the money changers. Everything that unfolds throughout this week is Jesus getting in the way and interrupting everything that was getting in the way of the poorest and the most oppressed and the people were hungry to find their way back into relationship and come to worship in the temple of the living God. Jesus interrupts all of the systems that had been created that were oppressing the people of his day. And I think that if we want to understand what does this mean for us today, it is for us to find within our own lives the ways that we can rest into the love and the courage and the confidence of the living God that we use our faith in order to make this world a much more loving and much more just place, that we use our faith in our spirituality to be able to open up access and to reach out to everybody who feels so outside of God's story. Just this past week, Toby and I met with somebody because we're thinking about putting solar on our house, and the fellow told us this story about how, how he had actually found his way into God, and that, and that, to, to God, and that he, he um, felt really... Um, aligned with, with this story and believed in this Jesus, but then he started looking for a church. And this, this 30 some odd year old fellow could not find a church that, that, that somehow correlated to what he understood and he read of the stories of Jesus and how it related to his life with the ways that any church, any church, um, somehow resonated. And I think why are there so many hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people? Why are there so many percentages of people within our own communities, in our own society, from all different kinds of backgrounds who no longer find their way into God's story here? Even people who say that they believe in the story and the one of this one who says that he is God's son, that they don't find within our communities, a place where they can worship and celebrate. I think that's what Jesus was standing up against. I think what Jesus was doing was getting in the way of everything that was getting in the way of the people. And I think that what Jesus is calling us to do and what God might be calling us to today as we celebrate this Holy Week is for us to be willing to go down to that journey, to let die the things that we need to let die in order to allow the body of Christ to be resurrected within and through our lives today. Individually, what does it mean for God to live within us? But collectively, what does it mean if we're going to be the body that resurrects the hope and the love of Jesus Christ? I don't know what that looks like. But what I do know is this. 
The second hour conversation that the governing board is inviting you to today is part of that story. It is for us to look deeply within our own hearts and figure out how do we work more closely with the churches that are within our community and how do we think about the ways that we are touching the people who are not in these pews today. People who don't find their way in to community on Sunday morning but might find their way in on Saturday or Wednesday or through a side door or a service project or a ministry? How can we bring our gifts together in order to be that kind of a church where people, no matter where they are on the journey, truly can find their way back into the love of God and know that this story, this story is the story for them, the story of hope and the story of love, no matter whether they worship on Sunday or on Monday or how can we be together on this journey? I believe that God will delight when we find our way back into justice and joy. That if there is love in this story, it is because we are finding the love of Jesus and we are bringing the justice of Jesus so that it's no longer just us, but justice for everyone who feels outside of God's story and oppressed by the systems and the economies and the discrimination that are so prevalent today. May God guide us. And may God inspire us. And may we find ways to wonder and hope and explore these scary, dangerous questions together. Amen. Morning. I'm Charles Votieri. I'm here this morning to, on behalf of the property management team, a small but dedicated group that does their best to maintain this church facility. But before I go much further, let me tell you a story about four people. Everybody, somebody, anybody, and nobody. There was a job to be done. Everybody was sure that somebody would do it. Anybody could have done it, but no one did. Somebody got upset about that, and be, but because it was everybody's job. Everybody thought that anybody could do it, but nobody realized it, that everybody wouldn't do it. It ended up that everyone was disappointed. Somebody, wait a minute, sorry. It ended up that everybody blamed somebody when nobody did what anybody could do. <laughs> you know, how, how proud we are of this historic building. It's just like our homes, it has, there's always something that needs our attention, right? Have you ever wondered how things get done around here? Who does it? When does it get done? There are a few, th you know, bless you. There are things that need to be cleaned. There's things that need to be stowed away or maybe even disposed of in some manner. There are routine chores such as mowing the lawn or monitoring the, the water system. Or even something as mundane as winding the clock in Harrison Hall. There are annual and biannual jobs, such as raising and lowering the storm windows and screens at the end of the season, installing and removing the air conditioners. Then there are those little things that just pop up, 
Maybe the icy walkway needs some, some salt or, or sand. The list can be extensive. You know, although we have a cleaning service that comes in once a week, it's difficult to keep up with everything. So, so who remembers Dick Horsfield? Years ago, Dick would wear a baseball cap when he solicited food for, for the community kitchen. Whenever you saw Dick come up up the aisle donning that baseball cap, you knew he was about to invite us to contribute towards that worthy cause. So that's my inspiration to come up with a hat of my own. <laughs> Doesn't quite fit just right, sorry. As I invite you to participate in the upkeep of our facility, any level of skill or commitment is welcome, whether you are a tradesman or someone who just be willing to tidy things up a bit, we welcome your help. Can I take this off? <clears throat> whether your commitment is long-term or short-term, planned or spontaneous, your efforts are appreciated. Some projects that come to mind are the organization of classrooms and materials downstairs, painting or even bringing the recycling bin up to the curb on Tuesday evening. Really, there's something for everyone. If you'd like to learn more about the property management team or would like to participate, you may see me at coffee hour or, or notify the office. One last thing. I'd like to remind you that this morning that our facility work request that form is on, resides on our website. Should you see something that requires attention, we invite you to fill out that form. This is part of our property management system where we, we can sort, evaluate, and prioritize and track maintenance of, of the facility. So please, um, do what you can. Now I'd like to invite you to uh, um, Offer you a gift. I'd like you to know that all your gifts are appreciated, but be it your energy, your time, or even monetary. And I invite you to deposit your gifts in either the trays at either one of the entrances. Thank you. In one voice we offer our prayer of dedication. God of love, you abide with us. You provide for all our needs and guide us in your ways. Out of gratitude for your care, we bring our gifts before you. Use them for your work of caring that all may feast at the table of abundance. Walk without fear, and drink deeply from the cup of compassion. Amen. Before we start our closing response, I am reminded by Charles's message today of, of one of my favorite benedictions. So I'm going to first invite you to repeat after me, and then we'll go on with our closing response. I am somebody. I am somebody. Look around and say this to somebody else. You are somebody. And we aren't anybody. We aren't anybody. We are the living body. We are the living body. The body of Christ. The body of Christ. Bringing hope and love to the world. Bringing hope and love to the world. Amen. See, you are somebody. With that, then, I invite you to join in our closing response. And now we lay down the palm branches to travel the road with courage, with love, and with the uneasy peace that is the gift of faith into this holiest of weeks. Amen.